hope we get more than five. <laughs> There's quite a few people signed up. So we're live on Facebook. Um, so whenever you'd like, I think we can let people in from the waiting room and we, we'll get started in a few minutes, I think. Sounds good. I'm also recording. Fabulous, thank you. So 1 o'clock. So we're going to get started with our BD at home. Um, so welcome, um, everyone, whether you're joining us here on Zoom or over on Facebook. Uh, we are going to learn about BC shellfish today from Sheila Byers. Um, so we'll get started. We're going to spend a couple minutes just doing, uh, just talking a little bit about uh, the museum. Um, and then I will hand it over to Sheila and we'll be learning from her. So... Uh, there we go. So Sheila Byers uh, is going to be presenting. Uh, my name is Kashfa. I will be uh, here to answer your questions off Zoom. Um, and then Nicole uh, will be answering your questions off Facebook or asking the questions for you uh, off Facebook. So you can ask questions in both places. Uh, I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, the BDE Biodiversity Museum is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, and you can see the flag of the Musqueam people um, uh, in front of you. Uh, and I've included a link to the First Peoples map of BC. So whichever territory you live on, you can uh, find that uh, for yourself on this website. Um, I also wanted to show you um, where the museum is on this map. So we are over at, over at UBC, as you can see, and uh, we're close to a lot of other wonderful institutions at UBC as well, like the Museum of Anthropology, which is now open, the Botanical Garden. Um, so uh, lots of great places to visit when you visit the BD as well. Um, and this is what we look like from the outside. And so you can see a very big skeleton right there. That is the biggest specimen in the museum, uh, a, the skeleton of a fully grown female blue whale. Uh, but the skeleton is just one of over 2 million things, specimens at the museum. So we have a lot more to see. And right behind the museum, the other building that you can see adjacent to it is the Biodiversity Research Center. And so uh, there are people, um, researchers studying all aspects of biodiversity, and those are uh, those are uh, mentioned here on the screen: um, ecology, evolution, taxonomy, so on. And some of the organisms they study are represented on this banner in front of you. 
in the in our museum we have six different collections um, and you can see them on the screen in front of you so we have our tetrapod collection with birds mammals reptiles amphibians uh, we have the herbarium with uh, plants and fungi insects fish fossils uh, and then uh, the marine invertebrates and that is the one that is represented with the abalone shell um, and so our presentation today is going to be uh, about a type uh, of marine invertebrates. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Sheila. So Sheila, if you'd like, you can share your, I'll stop sharing so you can share your Thank you. presentation. Okay, here we go. Thank you very much, Kashipa, for that introduction. And indeed, as you can see from these images, they are all invertebrates, i.e. without backbones. So I am going to say, oh, and why am I, sorry, I am not sh showing people. Hmm. Um, okay, but everybody can see what's on the screen, right? Not yet, Sheila, so it's not showing. What? Not again. Oops. Um, so the, the bar at the bottom has a green button, the share screen button. Yeah, but I'm not seeing that. Okay, let's try. Huh. Hey, Sheila, uh, you might want to try that alt tab to get back to Zoom, because I think you're probably in full screen for your presentation. Okay, back to Zoom. Here's my screen. Sorry about that. Sorry about this. Okay, are we seeing things now? No. Oh my gosh, what is happening? Oh dear. Okay, I'm trying the alt tab. Also, you might want to share your favorite, favorite shellfish. Uh, that could be here or anywhere. Um, so I'll go ahead and share one of mine. I don't want to give any spoilers for um, what she was sharing. I don't know uh, what she's brought along. But I really love... Um, now? Being, Sorry. Uh, a giant yes, Sheila, that sounds, that looks great. Okay, finally. Uh, and it will have a little spiral. Know what I'm talking about, you can put it in the chat as well. Uh, let's see if we can get people trying out the chat. Oh, okay, and we're good to go. Yes, sounds good. That looks great. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, as Kashipa said, we are talking about invertebrates today, and as you can see from these images, that's what we have on the screen. No backbones here. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you right off the bat that I don't like the word shellfish. Um, yes, there's lots of things that I'm going to talk about that have shells or sometimes exoskeletons are called shells, but none of these are fish. So uh, I'm going to go along with this name because you'll find out later that in fact, uh, there is probably a reason why they use it, or it is used, I should say, and it's certainly used by uh, restaurant people, fisheries people, and fishermen or fishers. So um, I am, there's many, many shellfish uh, and they belong to three major phyla, mollusks, which is your center clam here, uh, crustaceans, part of the arthropod phylum, and echinoderms as shown here with the sea urchin. 
Uh, there's no way I can cover everything. I'm going to be focusing primarily on the mollusks and a little bit on our crustaceans. So why are shellfish so important or so popular? Well, they're tasty. They're all also really good high protein content and really good omega-3 fats, low in saturated fats, although I do have to say that some shellfish have a lot of cholesterol. So that's something to think about when you're eating shellfish. Okay, moving right on to our phylum of mollusks. Now this looks very busy. Uh, it's basically just showing you the six different classes of mollusks. Snails or the gastropods. Oops. Um, bivalves, chitons, and cephalopods are all consumed as shellfish. I'm going to be, as I mentioned, focusing primarily on bivalves, um, but there are many other ones that I'm not mentioning, uh, especially in the cephalopod area and the snail uh, class or the gastropod class. So starting right off with bivalves, these obviously, I hope uh, if people know that they have two valves. Um, this is a very uh, watery picture of a butter clam, and I'm going to use this to show a little bit of anatomy. First of all, notice this very dark external ligament or hinge. It's very important for uh, keeping the two valves closed. And by the way, shells of mollusks are very much intended as protection of the soft body inside. And no surprise, the soft body is in fact what you're eating. Um, the umbo is here. That's the oldest part of the shell. At the ventral area here is the newest. Um, just for fun, noticing how this kind of curves that away, this would be the anterior end of the clam. And if you think about it, this is where the foot is going to be protruding to actually help bury the clams, which means that the siphons need to be headed towards the surface so that they can get access to the plankton in the overlying water column. So really, if you think about turning this image 90 degrees, you'd get a better idea of how the clams are generally positioned in the substrate at the bottom of the ocean. So foot to dig down, siphons to head up, uh, to access food. These are the siphons of the butter clam. They are um, relatively long. You know, can notice that they're black tipped and they're fused together. One is an incurrent siphon, bringing food and oxygen in. The bottom one is excurrent, getting rid of wastes. So that's, oh, three kind of structures to the shells of bivalves one of which is what we might call concentric lines. So you can see those curved lines there. More accurately, they're called commarginal, but I'm gonna use concentric, it's a little bit easier. Okay, here's a rum bone, here's your concentric lines, and there's that very large uh, hinge or ligament. So, and your uh, anterior facing end, and the posterior where the um, siphons are going to be moving out of. Uh, if we look at it sort of front on and open, here are the adductor muscles, and that's what is keeping those shells closed to protect all of the soft body of the mollusk inside. Um, it's those muscles that are releasing to open up the clams and the hinge is like your door hinge. So once those muscles relax a bit, the, the uh, clam valves will open. And that's important because of course they have to get the foot out to move and they have to get the siphons out to feed. Okay, now this, if we look at the interior of this butter clam, we'll see these muscle scars. So this is the posterior muscle that would attach to these two scars. This is the anterior scars of the anterior adductor muscle. Uh, important 
in terms or just usually uh, important for identifying, but what's identifying species, but what's actually really important is this paleocinus. And this is also indicative of where those siphons are protruding. And that will vary with the size of the siphons of the various species that um, we will be looking at. Okay. Uh, just to uh, identify again, important characteristics of the butter clam are these concentric lines and that really tough black hinge that sticks out very obviously. And I do have a butter clam here. Unfortunately, this one where the ligament would be attached uh, dried and fell off, but you can see very, very easily where that ligament would attach. And that was very characteristic of these butter clams. Okay, uh, sometimes you'll find clams, this is a butter clam again, but sometimes you'll find them looking awfully black instead of that chalky color. Uh, that's usually indicating that the sediments are anoxic and uh, there's a buildup of sulfides. So it just, the black is from those sulfides. Um, these butter clams are going to be about um, 15 centimeters in length. So from here to here, and they're buried about 10 centimeters deep into the substrate. Okay, butter clams are one of my favorites and obviously they are one of the favorites of many people because they have been part of recreational and com commercial harvest since the 1880s or thereabouts. Uh, and it's only been recently, like the 1970s, where Judith Williams and John Harper actually rediscovered clam gardens, which were very important for First Nations people up and down the coast, um, and thought to have existed as far back as 3,500 years. Um, and uh, the primary source for their butter clams were these clam gardens that they literally gardened, they dried the- uh, Can I put someone down on the ramp? Oh. Yes, it's clear, thanks. Oops, sorry, let no, me thanks. turn this down. Um, so they dried the clams uh, and um, they became a very important source through the winter for their protein, for their omega-3 fats. Uh, and if anybody enjoys Caesar cocktails, uh, it is the nectar from the clams that was actually harvested in addition to the actual soft body uh, and eventually made its way into Mott's Clamato juice, which is used in Caesar cocktails, one of my favorites, sorry, can't help but mention it. Um, and one of the other very important clam species that was found in the clam gardens is the native little neck clam or the Pacific little neck clam. So you can see two of those little necks here. Um, and I'm going to point this one out because it has ribs. And if we go even further down here, these are butter clams. So the point here is those three types of characteristics for the external sculpturing of the shells. Your butter clam has the concentric. This heart cockle has ribs. And the cancellate, cancellate of the little neck clam is a combination of both concentric and ribs. So you'll see those uh, ribs on the little neck here and then the crossing of the concentric. So it's, um, it can get to be almost as big as the butter clam. Uh, what else do I want to show here? Oh yeah, some of the different color variations. Uh, generally they're more like this look or notice that the look of the Little neck is quite what we would call subquadrate. So the height is almost the same as your uh, length. But notice also some of the patterning that's happening on these smaller uh, little neck clams, which is very characteristic of the juvenile ones. This becomes important for our next species. But let's go inside 
the little neck because I need you to see these little ridges or what we call serrations along the ventral edge of the uh, little neck clam. That is very characteristic of the little neck clam. Not only should you be able to see it, it's basically those ribs extending right around into the ventral side. Uh, not only should you be able to see them, you should be able to basically run your fingernail along them and feel, feel that, excuse me, serration. So that's a critical characteristic as well as that cancellate um, uh, sculpturing on the shells. But then there is another clam that looks awfully close to those native little necks. In fact, this manila clam is an introduced and in fact, some people will say invasive species um, that came in from uh, the eastern, sorry, yeah, eastern side of Asia, Western Pacific, Japan, Korea area. But look how similar these patterns are. A couple of important differences to note here is that they're longer than and not so quadrate, uh, so much longer this way. Um, in length than the native little neck. Um, and also notice these much stronger ribs towards the posterior area of the shell compared to the anterior section um, and compared to the little neck. Now, looking on the inside, this will be a dead giveaway as well. So you've got the edge of the um, manila clam purple, as well as the paleocyanus and the muscle scar here. Sometimes you'll get yellow, but that purple or yellow is very characteristic of the manila clam. So the manila clam, uh, it, it, sorry, the, the harvesting of the butter clam, and I forgot to mention that it was the major clam included in the BC Fairies, very famous chowder. Um, that whole industry kind of collapsed in about the 70s, 1970s, in part from paralytic shellfish poisoning, which I'll get to later. Um, but also, uh, it was getting over harvested. The manila clam became uh, easier to grow, or I should say, the, the amount of time it took to get to a harvestable size was shorter in time. So this manila clam tends to be the more uh, what you'll see more often in fish markets. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind. Unfortunately, it likes to inhabit the intertidal area pretty much in that mid-tide, mid-intertidal in area, pretty much where the native little neck is. And that's where you get this um, concern about the manila clam introduced that is uh, potentially driving out the Pacific little necks. Okay, moving on. Uh, here we have our third uh, sculptured characteristic of bivalves, and it is Newtall's cockle, or what I like to call the butter clam. But you can definitely see these ribs uh, extending throughout from the umbo, whoops, umbo to the ventral edge. Notice that there are also these little uh, concentric uh, edges along the rib. That's very characteristic, as are the number of ribs, because there are a number of different cockles. By the way, what is it? Cockles and cockles and alive, alive, oh. <laughs> that Irish tune about cockles. We don't have that many cockles here in the Pacific. Uh, this is one of the more prominent ones. Um, um, what else did I want to say about this? Let me just check, see if I covered everything. Sheila, while you're looking, I'll just um, share that we had some comments. I think about the manila clam. Nicole was just saying that the zigzag ones are very pretty. Thank and Nancy you. was saying that um, she didn't realize the patterns varied so much. Oh, sorry, the little neck. The little neck clams. I know. Oh, okay. So the patterns do vary enormously. And the other, nature is not simple. Um, the other 
oddity, or I guess, what can I say? Recently noted is that the native little neck and the Manila, introduced Manila clam have hybridized. So that is probably leading to some of the confusion with the patterns, uh, particularly on those native clams. So that's um, something worth taking note of. Um, okay. Uh, now the weird thing about these heart cockles is their siphon, and I should also have explained that siphons are an indication that these are all filter feeders. Uh, and that's when I mentioned the siphons need to reach to the surface of the sediment to have access to the water to get that plankton. Um, but the siphons on these um, heart cockles are very short and which means that they are actually barely covered by the sediment and what's, and you can see that here, uh, notice that this is about as long as they get. So it needs to be very close to the surface. Um, and unfortunately for them, things like seagulls and um, crows uh, either detect their siphons or, or note squirts from the, the uh, heart cockle as it tries to bury deeper and they get dug up very, very easily. And I have read that once they're dug up and you can see them when you're walking along the, the shoreline uh, out in the mud flash, flats, I should say, um, they, they, once they're out, they just don't seem to be able to, to get buried back into the sediment. Here's your heart shape here. So very cool. Um, heart cockles, but you'll notice on the, their ventral edge, that same ribbing comes right around to the inside of the shell. And between the ribs and the grooves, the ribs and the grooves, when you put those shells together like this, it is really, really hard for any type of predator to actually be able to twist these um, cockles open. So that's a pretty cool defensive mechanism. Uh, next, we go to another interesting and very colorful um, marketable species. And it is, as you can see from the color of these clams, a purple mahogany clam. Now, it also goes by the name of varnish clam. And you can see that from the color. Um, and more recently, because it is marketed, as the savory clam. So you're getting an idea here of how confusing common names can be. But nonetheless, uh, it can get to the size of um, ooh, easily about 15 centimeters lengthwise. And again, look at the inside. Huge, brilliant purple. I love the purple color of these things in spite of the fact that they are introduced and again, uh, considered to be inv invasive because of, uh, they're mostly towards the mid and upper intertidal, but driving out other native species. Um, they have quite a long siphon. Look at how long this paleo sinus is, but that purple color is very indicative. And I will throw out this thought. Um, they, purple, you'll notice with the manila clam and this mahogany clam, purple on the inside, seems to be pretty characteristic of introduced species. It's not a blanket statement, but certainly for these two species, it's very relevant. Um, they're very flat and they're weird because they actually bury themselves, but lie uh, horizontal uh, to the surface. And then they reach out with their that's their foot actually, but they reach out with their siphons, which are very long and they're separate up to the surface of uh, the sediment. From there, they can actually bury as deep as 20 centimeters. So that long siphon makes quite a difference in their uh, um, ability to bury deeper. Okay, I think everyone's relatively familiar with the blue mussel. This is a smallish one, but you get the very blue. This one has a few bissel threads on it, which you're not gonna be able to see very easily, 
Uh, this is fairly small. It will get longer than that, or sorry, they do get longer than that. But this is a very popular item for, for eating and finding in markets. Uh, a thing to remember is there are two other possible blue mussel species on our coast. So Mytilus edulis, which is actually an Atlantic species that is also found in the Arctic, um, is grown in aquaculture farms here uh, and also down in Birch Bay um, area. Oh dear, sorry, excuse me, da -da, yikes. Um, and, and the other one is uh, Gallo Provincialis, which is the Mediterranean mussel. And it also has been brought in for aquaculture purposes. So they're very, very hard to tell apart. Um, so that's, uh, this was taken at Stanley Park. There's many, many mussels around with attaching to rock surfaces with that Bissell thread. Um, but just keep that in mind uh, that if you go shopping for mussels, uh, you could be getting um, one of three species. Shouldn't make a difference, but just so that you know that. Uh, oh, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. <laughs> Sheila, is it okay if I ask a question? Sure. For now, sure. yeah. So uh, Nicole asked, do we have any purple shelled local bivalves? So I guess this is one, but do we have? Purple shelled local or native. Uh, other than the blue mussel, which is close to purple. Um, the rock scallop can be a kind of a pinky purple color, but it's much bigger and much easier to, to distinguish. In fact, we, it's rarely seen by us in terms of walking the beach uh, and seen by divers in particular. Um, I'll get into some pink, Sounds but good. nothing else is coming to mind with awesome. purple. Can I just acknowledge just a couple of comments before yeah. we move on? So yeah. when we were, I think you mentioned the, the song with the cockles and mussels. So yeah. Nancy just shared a, a link uh, cool. to the Irish song about it. Um, and then Nancy also said that she, she finds the purple mahogany clams the most, and I would agree with her. And she's wondering if they're the most common clam in the Vancouver area. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, that is I think a good observation in terms of what can happen with introduced species. Uh, the mahogany clam was introduced in ballast water uh, in 19, is it 29? Uh, let me just get my dates here. 1991 in Semiamu Bay. Um, through ballast water. So uh, if people understand the significance of ballast water and the request by governments for ships to uh, release their ballast water offshore, that is the reason because if they fill up their tanks in, in this case, in um, Asia and bring that load of whatever they're bringing over here and then get rid of the ballast water in local waters, whatever, larval forms are in the ballast water will potentially become uh, an introduced species here. And that includes worms, all kinds of things like that. And that's how the mahogany clam came in. And it is quite prolific. It seems to be very well adapted to this uh, um, climate, uh, environment, ocean environment here. So it is very abundant you are hard pressed to find Pacific native little clams, uh, unless you go further up the coast where there's fewer influences from, sit, from the cities. Um, I would say the mahogany clam probably competes though with the Manila clam in terms of abundance. So it's going to, going, to, going to depend more on the actual substrate. I, I think the uh, mahogany clam has more uh, adaptation to a lot of different types of sediments, whereas um, I'm going to suggest that the manila likes it a little bit more muddy. 
Awesome. So, Sunday month. Yep. Awesome. Shelby, do you have two more questions? That's okay. good for you. So yep. Nicole's just following up on her comment about purple, and she's saying if like a royal purple would be a good clue about non-native species. Um, so I, I like to think that that's the case, but it's a, a very general statement um, because I'm going to be showing another one that doesn't necessarily stay with that rule. So definitely those two species do, um, but it's, I think it's too, too broad to uh, blanket statement. Yeah. Um, so one more question for now. Jeff has a really good question. Um, he asks, are you distinguishing between introduced versus invasive and are these synonyms? So introduced, I'm using in the sense that it, it is not from here, it's not local, but it tends to not be uh, a problem in terms of ecosystem impacts with the native species. But uh, you may have noticed that I did say introduced and invasive for both the Manila clam and the mahogany clam, because a lot of people do consider them as invasive, so that they are, in fact, pushing out the native species. So I, I have used both of those, but uh, people will say that they're invasive, those two species. Does that make sense? Sounds good. Thank you, Sheila. OK, thanks. OK, so you can see the inside of your muscle here. And here are the muscles, the adductor muscles that would be pulling these two valves together to protect that soft inside and the very uh, much smaller, uh, actually, I think it's going there, uh, muscle at the, the um, I don't know if this is the posterior or anterior end of the muscle, but the, nonetheless, the, there's your muscle and you would be eating that whole, um, Actually, this one, sorry, I've got the, yeah, there's the muscle there and there. Okay, uh, next, uh, they, they are very uh, abundant, obviously, the muscles, and very important, I should say. Um, those bissel threads, which you are hard pressed to see here, um, but if you ever look at a bed like this, you'll see those bissel threads. They're very sensitive to things like copper. So uh, they are used as an indicator species for en environmental purposes. Um, okay, one of my favorites, the spiny pink scallop. And here we are with that ribbed sculpture. sculpture uh, quite widely spaced, but another thing to keep an eye eye on is the little ridges or spines that you can see on these ribs, similarly here and there in particular. So that those are very important characteristics of the scallops and also uh, the wing that comes out here at, uh, from the area of the umbo. Um, these are often encrusted with sponge, uh, so they're not uh, always that visible. Again, you won't be seeing these intertidally, but um, I wanted to include them because they're kind of cool. Uh, notice the eye spots here and the tentacles. Their foot is very reduced um, because they swim. They're called swimming scallops, but here you can see the sponge encrusting on the surface of the um, scallop. And here is a very ripe gonad. So here you have the gonad. There is the muscle. So generally when we think of scallops, and this image by the way is not of the uh, spiny pink scallop, generally it's just the muscle. So there's only the one muscle in scallops that is holding the two valves or shells together. Uh, and, and if you have eaten Digby scallops, uh, they are very large and Seldomly do you eat the entire body, soft body of the scallop. With the pink scallop, you do because it's much smaller uh, and you just basically steam the whole, the whole thing. I'm going to try this because they are fun to see swimming. Notice the, how big the finger is here. Yeah. 
Okay. So there you are. That's uh, their defense mechanism to escape predators, and they don't bury. They just which is why the foot is diminished or non-existent. Uh, they just lie on top of the, of the substrate and swim away when needed. Okay, so here we are with oysters, which are very popular. Uh, I don't know if everybody's tried Rockefeller um, oyster, but many different, or even raw. Lots of people like to eat oysters raw. Um, the oysters have had a very long history in BC. There is a native oyster, but it is quite small, very slow going, and was rapidly over harvested, particularly um, lo in the lower mainland area. There are a couple of populations left, but not many. This is a Pacific oyster, uh, again originating from the west coast of, or sorry, West Pacific Ocean, West Side Japan area. Um, with the uh, native Olympic oyster, uh, it, I guess the need arose or the demand arose for more oyster growing uh, aquaculture. Uh, initially, there was a species brought in from the Atlantic Ocean and I like to talk about Boundary Bay because that's close at hand uh, and near Sawasan, between Sawasan and White Rock, basically. Um, and uh, it was the, the Atlantic oyster was brought in there, uh, introduced there, and basically all the way down to San Francisco in the early 1900s. The Atlantic oyster didn't do that well for a number of reasons. Uh, so then oysters were brought in from Japan but they were brought in as spat and they were packed in um, seaweeds. Uh, little did people know at the time, so this would have been in the uh, 50s, I believe, um, that many other larval forms were in that seaweed as well. So Boundary Bay, at least 50% of all of the species that are there are introduced and again, some people would call them invasive, but they were de definitely introduced with the introduction of the Pacific oyster. So notice the ripply flutes along the edge. Uh, these Pacific oysters can be huge. Uh, this is a rather large one, but they can be about 18 uh is it centimeters that's not enough 18 45 centimeters in length so they can be huge that's not my favorite size to be eating but nonetheless they are very productive and very abundant in fact these are probably the most prolific species grown all over the world for um marketing um notice also that the bottom shell is quite cup-shaped, and this is where it would attach to rocks. So it's going to be sitting on the rock with that upper valve opening to allow um, siphons to uh, do their filtering. Um, okay, so if we look on the inside, there's that nice cup shape. Uh, there is a little bit of purple here on the muscle scar, not a lot, and they don't get that total interior purple color, but I have to say that this is an introduced species and it does have uh, some of that purple, and that's gonna vary a lot, but nonetheless, it's there. Um, num, 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 num. Okay, Sheila, uh, there's a question, but... Yep. Whenever, is this a good time? Sure. So uh, Keely asks, um, uh, I think this is going back to the mussels. Uh, she says, did you address why some of the mussels are differently colored? Um, why oh. sometimes there seems to be a brownish one among the blue ones? Right. So they can have two, I think you could call them maybe phenotypic color variations. Uh, the, the dark blue, uh, and here's a couple of brown ones right here. 
like that and there. Um, it, I believe, has to do with temperature. So, for example, if we went to California, we would probably find the reverse, more of the brown color than the black, or sorry, blue, dark black blue, uh, because the um, colder water, it, the dark helps to, um, I guess, regulate heat in the muscles. Uh, so fewer brown ones uh, uh, are effective up here. Uh, as opposed to California where they would, the black blue color would be less tolerant of the warmer water in California. That's my understanding. So hopefully that answers Keeley's question. Um, but, but far fewer brown ones, certainly in the BC area. Okay. Uh, Keeley says yes and says thank you as well. Okay, awesome. Okay, going on to, ah, Good, we are into the arthropods and uh, crustaceans in particular. So um, many crustaceans that are eaten include crabs. They include prawn or shrimp. They can include lobsters. Now this is a, an Atlantic lobster. It is available in markets out here. It does not live out here. Um, there is also a Pacific oyster, which doesn't have these huge, huge chelipeds, um, but it's definitely available in um, live in markets here, certainly down on Granville Island. This is a crayfish, so it's freshwater, but just so you know, that's also a popular eating item. Um, I have a Swedish neighbor and it was a Christmas celebration uh, delight for them basically every year. Uh, and then there's things like not only the regular common uh, barnacle, but gooseneck barnacles, in which case you're eating this uh, long neck of the barnacles. I'm going to focus just on shrimp and crabs, but you'll notice the shell for the shellfish that includes crabs and shrimp is really an exoskeleton that's getting molted every year. Oh, sorry, when they're juveniles, hmm, seven or eight times a year for crabs. Um, but nonetheless, not shell in the sense of your mollusk shells. Okay, here's our spot prawn, beautiful and very, very large. If I can put that next to my face, you can see that these prawns are large. So I'm also going to say that um, more correctly, they are shrimp. They were basically named prawns because they are the largest shrimp. Uh, in the Pacific, I'm sorry, I should say on the west coast of North America. They're huge. Uh, can I give you an actual size on that? Maybe 25 centimeters in length. Uh, and they are easily identified, not only from their size, but four spots. So we see two, and on the other side, there's one. On the other side, there's one. So we can call them four spot or two pair. Uh, spot prawns and these large white uh, stripes on the thorax um, area. Okay, very delicious. Um, they are easily attainable locally in the sense that how sound has become quite the uh, resource for spot prawns. I could go into the whole thing about glass sponge reefs in how sound which uh, prevents the majority of trapping for um, spot prawns because those reefs have now been protected and traps, whether shrimp traps or prawn traps are prohibited. Um, but nonetheless, they are so far a sustainable fisheries. Um, the interesting thing, and Jeff Marliav at the aquarium was uh, one of the people that did some work on these. Uh, these prawns 
um, basically start their lives out as males. And then by the time they're about two or three years old, they switch to females. So the traps, the mesh on them will be large enough that small prawns are not caught. Uh, however, there is some concern that if it's the females that are getting caught, they tend to only spawn once in their four year lifespan. So not sure how this is all going to, to pan out so far so good, but um, there is that bit of a concern. Uh, also, the season is very short. It's generally only part of May, part of June, somewhere in there. In fact, this year it was delayed for an entire month because of the pandemic. Uh, but they, they, they're, they, they are a fisheries that is carefully watched um, and opening times are uh, provided when the females are not gravid. They, they tend to be gravid more in the fall. Um, so commercially, at least, they are very tightly controlled recreationally. Uh, people are supposed to learn about these species and um, understand when they can and cannot fish. And having said that, I just wanted to show you that there's this excellent amount of information on the Fisheries and Oceans website here, uh, all about their life cycle uh, and uh, very interesting. Okay, moving on, we have a side stripe shrimp. Uh, it can be almost as big as the spot prawn, not quite, and it's generally taken by trawls, trawling, a, a larger net, but they do have these side stripes on their abdomen, no spots like the spot prawn and no specific banding here like the spot prawn has. Uh, they are very, quite, quite prolific. And um, let me just see what else I was going to say there. Probably not too much, except that they're very important up and down the coast. Um, Yep, and, and large pleopods here, which is how they do a lot of their swimming. So on to a spiny pink or northern shrimp. This is another one that's very important all the way up to Alaska down to California. Uh, and note the spines here along the abdomen. Um, not quite as large as the, the um, side stripe, but uh, fairly abundant, I would say, almost as a uh, side catch in other uh, trawling nets. Um, okay, that's all I'm going to say about that because I want to get to the Dungeness crab, which is quite accessible off many areas, Boundary Bay, Belcara, Indian Arm area, uh, and um, it is measured from this tip to this tip. And yes, the rock crab, which is a little bit smaller and has very black claws and a slightly uh, much redder, I should say, um, body to it. Uh, if you go crabbing, so you could, it could be by pots or it could be by, um, uh, I don't even know what they're called, but it's almost like a golf stick with a broad base to it that if you jab the crab enough it will grab on and it tends to just hold on and you haul it out of the water as you're walking through the eelgrass um, and that's often how local people will catch some of theirs uh, their crabs but note that there is very strict restrictions on that carapace um, width much smaller for the rock crab and for neither of these species can you keep the female, which is a very broad abdomen, as opposed to the male. You must throw the females back in because that is legal, legally bound, binding. Um, and in other words, you're only catching males and they must be of this size. Okay, so very quick thought on paralytic shellfish poisoning. They any shellfish like the butter clams or the manila clams uh, that uh, take in these dinoflagellates, most of which are 
Alexandrium catenella, they are toxic and they are neurotoxins. So uh, you don't, if you're, if you eat something and for a, a clam and you start to get a tingling lips or tingling tongue, tongue you want to be sure before you even think about harvesting locally or anywhere as far as that's concerned that you are near to medical assistance because if that if you've consumed a lot and there's been a lot that the uh, clams have have um, ingested and filtered then you could stop breathing and that's not a good not a good thing uh, some people have thought uh, sorry the, the um, dinoflagellate, the paralytic shellfish po poisoning, accumulates in different parts of the body of clams. For, for example, in the butter clam, it's in the siphons. And there's some very cool information about predator-prey interaction there. Um, but they can also accumulate in the stomachs. And um, so, you know, just taking or eating part of the body of the clam is not going to be a solution. And the, the bad, sad part is that lobsters, crabs, whelks, who eat clams that have been contaminated with paralytic shellfish poisoning, um, can also uh, contain and accumulate that toxin. So my first word of, of advice is Really, people shouldn't be eating anything from the lower mainland area, considering outflows from the Lionsgate uh, waste manage, uh, wastewater um, plant. Um, also, uh, off the delta of the Fraser River, there's uh, wastewater effluent there. So really, lower mainland is not a good idea for harvesting anything, anything like this. You need to be going further afield. Crabs are a little bit different. Um, but I would still be cautious. And in other words, DFO does not have the manpower to set up signs where they know that paralytic shellfish poisoning has just bloomed. So that's first word of warning. Secondly, you need a license. So one of the reasons that shellfish probably are also called shellfish is it falls under the Tidal Waters Sport Fishing License. Uh, it's not expensive. I think it's, it was $20. I think it's something like $21.46 per person. Licenses are not transferable. You cannot hold more than one. Uh, always check for the contaminated um, paralytic shellfish poisoning. And please do help sustain these important species that we all like to eat by contacting uh, this number or toll free at this number. Um, I have seen in Boundary Bay uh, fisheries officers there uh, fining people who have taken females or their crabs, for example, sorry, female crabs, or the crabs were short, smaller than the um, legal size. She will okay. share something on that topic from our, yes, from our chat. So yep. Keely is sharing a few things uh, related to this. Uh, she mentioned that um, she didn't, they're not seeing many Dungeness crabs, even juveniles at Belcara this mm. year so far. Mm. Um, and so there's uh, some conversation about monitoring different crab species. They they're monitoring. They've seen declines in uh, crab species previously. And this year, the red rock crab Seems a little less than normal, but not by much. Mm. Um, and then Keely's also just adding on to what you said about licenses, that even with a license, you cannot retain more than four legal sized male crabs. Oh, good point, Keely. Uh, that applies also to clams. Um, there is a bag limit, like you can only take so many clams. So that's a good point. In other words, if you intend to do harvesting of any sort on your own, you do need to do your homework. Um, you're, you're not only uh, setting good example for other people, but you're also helping to sustain these species. And I know uh, when Keely mentions uh, Belcara, uh, they, they're over my familiarity with the area, at least for the past 10 years, there has been an incredible difficulty in uh, convincing people that they're taking females 
and two, the crabs are too small. It's been very hard to get that uh, recreational fishery under control. So I think they're having more enforcement now, but um, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm extrapolating that I'm in part not surprised that they're not seeing many um, crabs recruit in that area because they've been devastated over the past number of years. Yeah, so it's, it's yes. Awesome. So Sheila, just two things. So uh, just one more thing from Keely. She's saying she's definitely seen a fair amount of DFO enforcement. Good, good, good. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention was that it is 158. So we've got yep. a and I am, I am all done. Thank oh, you. Oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, was... She's also, which is one more comment. She said that um, we have seen people take off just the claws. Oh, oh, right. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. I, it, it's, uh, so here we are with education. People do not understand that these uh, species do not go on forever. There is not a continuous supply unless we help them to keep their populations at a rate that they, that they are sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard struggle. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, so if anyone has any questions, whether uh, here on Zoom or on Facebook, type them in. We've got a few more minutes um, and then we will wrap up. Okay. So uh, Keely is saying thank you, Sheila. You're welcome. Thanks for attending. Uh, uh, Nancy is saying uh, there's a myth out there that the crabs will be fine without their claws. Of course they need them. Um, I think they do that with stone crabs in the U.S. Question mark. Oh, the uh, hmm, that's possible. I don't know about the stone crabs, except that their their exoskeleton is really strong. Uh, yes, they re um, they will. Hmm, when they um, molt, I. I, you know what? I'm not sure if they can regenerate their claws because the, the claw has to be there for them to make the new molt, the whole body, uh, the claws need to be there for that new molt to actually start forming. So if the claw's gone, oh, sorry, they can regenerate, but that also takes a very long period of time. And as the claw is much smaller, and especially if they take off both claws, then the crab becomes much more uh, prone to predation because it has nothing or very small uh, claws that will be uh, own that that's all that will be able to defend and protect the crab. So that's uh, that's re regenerating or it's not really, yeah, I guess it's regenerating. Um, it is possible, but it puts crabs in particular at great risk. Awesome. Um, so we've got a few questions suddenly, so which is great. Thank you. Um, so Nicole is just adding that it's also cruel to take the claws off the Absolutely. crabs. So just yeah. that. Um, Keely is saying, um, would it be plausible to find relatively small Pacific oysters growing on intertidal rocks at Belcara? I've been finding more and more oysters, but they've got pink streaking on the outside. So it's not Olympia. The only place that I know uh, that Olympia grows is, at least in the lower mainland, is in Boundary Bay, Mud Bay um, area. So at the very east side of Boundary Bay, that uh, according to Andy Lamb anyway. I, I believe they do exist further up the coast, but uh, the populations are probably difficult to find. Um, so that's interesting. I have seen more Pacific oysters throughout Stanley Park um never used to be there and i'm finding them on the beach there as well as around uh into coal harbor so in some ways that doesn't surprise me that they have spread to balcara i don't know about the pink pink uh stripes but but i i wouldn't be surprised if it was the pacific oyster there at all okay yeah Thanks. Jeff is asking, can you talk about natural predators of mollusks or crabs, such as sea otters? Ooh. Well, I'll have to show you the favorite, though, of the sea otter, which is 
a sea urchin. <laughs> and right now, sea otters are probably having a, 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 a feast on all of the sea urchins uh, because the predator sea star has been, um, the populations have dropped back uh, over the past number of years because of climate warming. Um, so yes, uh, otters love clams. They will eat snails. They love abalone. I didn't even mention abalone. Uh, their favorite though is the urchin. Uh, crabs love clams and they're these heart cockles, um, which I mentioned you cannot twist open, uh, rock crab in particular, and I believe the Dungeness crab as well, will pinch with their pincers like 200 times until it's able to either crack the shell or cause um, a lack of oxygen, I would say, for the heart cockle and get it open that way. But they, the, the rock crab in particular are well known for this method of preying on the heart cockle. So other uh, crabs, crabs are gonna eat, for example, if, um, if a bird dropped, uh, dug up a heart cockle or another type of clam, went up into the air and dropped it to break it, uh, crabs will be in there shortly thereafter to get the little bits of muscle strands that the seagulls don't necessarily eat. So um, yeah, cool. I could go we, on. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got two more, we're running short on time, but we get two more really good questions from Audrey. Uh, the first question is, are octopus and squid considered shellfish? Yes, uh, yes, yes. Okay. I, I, I have to say again, I'm, I, did, I specifically, I was gonna cover the octopus, but I decided not to because I, I, I don't like the fact that it is fished um, from the perspective that they also only live for four years. So it can, they can be easily, uh, their populations can be easily impacted um, by us harvesting them. Uh, squid, uh, the squid that we get locally, I don't think is the loco squid. I could be wrong on that, but I didn't check uh, specifically. We do certainly have a local squid species, um, but I don't think that's what we generally find in certainly um, grocery stores and frozen. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of grocery stores, um, the other question from Audrey is, I see prawn and shrimp used interchangeably. Mm. Are they distinct scientific groups or are, they, are their names based off size, where they're found? How can one tell the difference? Yeah, so the, the prawn specifically talks about the large shrimp. And at this point, that large shrimp is the spot prawn. It is the largest. So that's really the primary distinction. I don't know how long ago it was given that name, but technically a prawn is a shrimp. It's just that the spot prawn is the largest shrimp. So it was given a nice big special name. Um, what was the other part of that question? Oh, um, whether the different groups which you've addressed oh. um, and can, is there a way to tell a difference between a prawn and a shrimp? Size. Well, I think as long as you can figure out whether or not you've got a prawn, the spot prawn, it, the characteristics are very distinct, then you'll know you've got a prawn. However, I will tell you that uh, the technical distinction is between two infra orders of the shrimp. So I'm going to say infra order caridia are the shrimp and Pineidae, Pine, sorry, Pineidea are the prawns, okay? So they, they are technically distinguished other than just by size uh, by those two infra orders. I, sorry, and I should say, even though that's saying another uh, infra order, I am not familiar of other prawns locally, um, but this, probably applies to worldwide and there might be other types of, of large shrimp that are called prawns elsewhere. Yeah. Okay, awesome. 
Uh, I just want to quickly acknowledge some, some comments um, and I think we're it for questions. Yeah. Um, there was some talk about the, the claws being generated by the crabs. So even if crabs could generate the claws, they're still vulnerable yeah. um, and can't eat. So uh, hard for them to survive. Yeah. Um, we've got a bunch of thank yous. Oh, great. Um, yeah. Um, so I think we'll wrap it up there if, if that's okay with you. Yes, that's um, fine. I'm going wonderful. to stop sharing. Awesome. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to, uh, oh, I'm just seeing a bunch of thank yous. And I just want to mention that Jeff has included a link of difference between krill and shrimp. So oh. that's something that. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, like. Yeah. I consider krill not shrimp at all. So I consider them quite different, even though they right. superficially look similar. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, consider them totally different from shrimp, but I haven't looked into that connection. So I oh, there's there's a link included. So he's included yeah. a link in the comments. So if people are interested, you can look Perfect. at that. Um, so I do want, I'm, I am going to uh, wrap up there. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. And thank you, Sheila, for that. You're wonderful welcome. comprehensive presentation. I've learned so much personally. Um, so thank you. Um, and for everybody joining us, just so you know, we do this every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Um, and we do different topics. So next Wednesday, we will have uh, a talk on bryophytes, fungi, and lichen by Dr. Karen Galinsky, who is our curator oh. of bryophytes, fungi, and lichen. So uh, I hope that you'll join us and learn a little bit about that. Uh, but other than that, um, Thank you and uh, hope you have a good rest of the day.